and welcome to Engineering with Rosie Live. Um, yeah, and thanks to everybody for, for joining, especially I've got a couple of comments here. Um, somebody even managed to tune in from LA. I think it's uh, middle of the night there, isn't it? So that's a, that's a good one. Thank you. And biggest thank you to the guest that we have today. This is Nicholas Gordon. Um, he's the CTO at Power Curve, and he's an expert in wind turbine aerodynamics. He designs blades, aerofoils, and blade add-ons. So I'm really excited to have Nick here today because blade aerodynamics is um, probably the most frequently asked about topic when I make um, videos on wind energy. And Nick is definitely the perfect guy to answer these questions. So Nick, thanks for coming. And can you just tell you. us really, tell us really briefly about um, yeah who you are and, and what you and um, and Power Curve do? Sure. Evening, Rosie. Really nice to be on the uh, the show with you. So yes, I'm Nick. I'm um, Chief Technology Officer at Power Curve. Um, I've been involved in the wind industry for about twelve years. It's been my only career, and I love it. I love wind turbines. I love designing aerofoils, blades, add-ons. So started off investors, um, like a lot of other people in the industry, and that gave me a really great foundation. But uh, today my focus is on aerodynamic upgrades. So Power Curve's a, a small Danish company, and we go around the world looking for opportunities to make turbines better. So any wind turbine that's out there today uh, has potential to produce more energy and that could be due to design factors or it could be due to local site factors so we'll go and analyze those turbines and we'll recommend an upgrade pack uh, to basically give it the best chance of performing really well for the rest of its lifetime okay cool so we'll obviously be talking a lot more about all those details later but first of all um hi again to all the viewers and I'd ask you to get in the comments and tell me a little bit about yourself. Are you an engineer, an engineering enthusiast? Maybe you work in the energy industry or, yeah, tell us tell us why you're here today and um, what you're hoping to learn about. Um, and I do have to uh, give a, a big thanks, especially to all of the people that have turned into crazy time zones. It's um, a bit hard with me in Australia. Nick's obviously in, um, in Europe and, yeah, to catch the American time zone as well is, uh, yeah, pretty much impossible. So, um, first of all, I want to thank the sponsor of these live streams. It's sponsored by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. They make strike tape. Um, that's a retrofitable lightning protection system for uh, wind turbines and also for airplanes. And I want to really thank the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community who um, are always helping me out with uh, interesting questions for live streams and the videos that I make. Um, so, yeah, thank you to both of them for their contribution. Okay, so um, in the show today, um, first of all, Nick's going to introduce the topic of blade aerodynamics and add-ons, and I'm going to start with a, a list that I already have of some of the really common questions that I get asked, which is um, CFD modelling, how that works for wind turbines, um, also winglets. People always ask, why don't we see wind turbine blades with winglets on them? Because you see a lot of aeroplane wings with winglets. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one is tubercles, which are the bumps that a um, killer whale, no, not a killer whale, a humpback whale has on their fins. And it is a surprising, <laughs> surprisingly common um, yeah, question that I get asked. So um, I have I have pre, I've worded Nick up on on these, given him the, the chance yeah. to, to look up on it. So yeah. I know he's prepared. Um, okay, so first, Nick, could you introduce the topic of blade aerodynamics? Um, tell us what blade add-ons are, what kinds there are, sure. and what they do to wind turbine blade aerodynamics. Yeah, absolutely. So blade aerodynamics is, is critical. So um, obviously the, the blade is the first thing that the wind sees. And anything that happens on the blade gets transferred all through the wind turbine system. So it's it's the start of the load path for both the good loads, uh, which lead to torque and power, and the bad loads, which lead to thrust and uh, drivetrain issues, all this kind of stuff. So blade air announce is crucial because what you do there is um, is the start. It's the start of the river, basically, of all these kind of things. And blade aerodynamics has come on a lot in recent years due to computational advances. But I would say that in general, uh, the wind industry is not quite as advanced as lots of other disciplines, such as um, aerospace or maybe motorsport like Formula One, things like this. 
and part of that is the the industry is a little bit immature uh, compared to compared to those industries. Um, but also aerodynamics is just really hard. <laughs> um, it's a hard topic to understand. It's a hard topic to simulate. And if you're basically in, in a race to establish an industry and, and to compete, it can be pretty difficult to focus lots of lots of time. And if we, you've also got to remember that you know aerodynamics as a discipline has been around for quite a long time, a few, you know, a few tens of decades. And when wind energy started out, people said, well, we can just take an aerofoil from, a, from an aeroplane, for example, or, or something like that. We can turn it into a rotor. And that does work. Um, but as the blades have got bigger and bigger and bigger, the, the aerodynamic requirement has changed quite a lot. And a lot of that's got to do with thickness. Like you have to make these blades really thick to make them structurally efficient. And I don't know if you've ever looked out at an aeroplane wing, but they're really thin relatively. Their thickness to chord ratio, as we, as we call it. So blade aerodynamics kind of has to, yeah, there's a great image on the screen here now. So you can see down towards the, the top left of the image, you've got these really thick cylindrical sections. And then gradually they're starting to look a little bit more aerofoil shaped. And then out at the tip, you have something that kind of resembles a typical aerodynamic section. So yeah, we have this real spread of aerofoil thicknesses and, and herein lies a big challenge of wind turbine aerodynamics. It's how do you design a really nice thin section and how do you also design a really nice thick section? And wind tunnel testing, which is kind of the key tool in the toolbox or certainly has been until recently, is really expensive and time consuming. So people were very, very keen to just use aerofoils that were developed 40 years ago by NASA or NACA as they were called then because then the data is there in a textbook to use. The problem is that, you know, it's just not optimized. It's nowhere near optimized to the real aerodynamic problem that the blade sees. So I think in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot more attention focused on wind turbine specific aerodynamics. Um, okay, can yeah. I just interject? Because that yeah, actually sure. relates really well to a question that I had from um, the Patreon group from Chris. He asks, uh, how do wind turbine designers select their airfoils? What are the standard airfoils in use today? And how do designers decide how to vary the profile over the length of the wind turbine blade? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so there are standard airfoils. Um, and I would say there's kind of maybe three or four common families. One is the NACA airfoil family. And if you're into that kind of thing, it's like a 63.4 series or a 63.6 uh, series. They're pretty common. And yet we also have this family, as it says on there, the NACA 64.618, very common. The DU Aerofoils, that's Delft University. Uh, that's also an incredibly commonly used family of Aerofoils, particularly on turbines that are being made in Asia, I would say. Uh, there's also some FFA aerofoils, they're Swedish of origin, there's some uh, Rizu, so DTU aerofoil families. So these are kind of really common families that are, that are used out there in the field. And there's a few reasons you might select one over the other. Um, and it's kind of down to their characteristics of, of what lift do, do, do they produce at a given angle of attack and what drag do they produce at a given angle of attack. As you're designing your blade, you'll kind of settle on a lift that you want. So you kind of then need to find an aerofoil that's going to give you that kind of lift. But this kind of comes back into this, uh, this way of thinking of should we be choosing aerofoils off the shelf or should we be designing custom? If you pick aerofoils off the shelf, I have to say a blade almost designs itself for you. So if you want peak efficiency from a, an aerofoil family that already exists, you can only really operate them at one angle of attack, one pitch position, one, one place. And hopefully that will fit your design intent for the rest of the machine. But if it doesn't, you've just got to use them anyway because you've, you know, you're taking them off the shelf. So as an aerodynamicist, I would strongly recommend maybe doing some custom aerofoil design. So then you can have that design variable free when you're putting your blade together. Okay, and I actually had a question on the um, on the community post that I did. Somebody asked, "Is um, it's Mitch, and he is obviously designing a, a wind turbine rotor, and he's kind of asking, how do you get started? Because you've got the cord and the CL need to, you know, they're they're related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. for somebody, you know, a lot of our viewers are." Um, 
a wind energy enthusiast, backyard wind energy engineers, I would call them. So, and students, a lot of students as well doing design projects. <clears throat> what would you recommend for them? Probably they're not going to be designing their own airfoil or if they are, they're yeah. you know, not going to be able to wind tunnel test it. Um, what's a good starting off point? Yes, the reason I say the blade almost designs itself is, yes, yeah, very much linked to this question. So if you take a, let me see if I've got it on one of my slides. Yeah, if you go to slide eight, Rosie, if you happen to have that clear from my slides, we could talk about that. Second to last should be. Yeah. So um, what I've got here are two graphs, the kind of critical performance graphs for any aerofoil. And on the left, I've got lift versus angle of attack. And on the right, I've got uh, lift to drag ratio. So a measure of efficiency versus angle of attack. And let's just focus on one curve. Let's just look at the blue curve for now. So what we can see is that lift increases pretty linearly up to a given point. Then it starts losing linearity. And then the lift starts to decrease with angle of attack. And that's uh, that stall. That's when the airfoil is stalling. But on the right, we can see that there's um, this peak lift to drag ratio that is actually occurring before stall. So if you kind of look at the red dashed line for reference, you would want to operate your airfoil in an ideal world where it's peak efficiency is peak lift to drag ratio. So if you want to operate at peak lift to drag ratio, which will give you the most power from your turbine, then that gives you your CL because it's given you an angle of attack. And then on the other curve, the left-hand curve, you can see what CL that is. In reality, you'll take a few other things into consideration like stall margin and dirt contamination, all these kind of things. But as a general starting point, pick the peak lift to drag ratio angle of attack, and then that's a good starting CL. Okay, um, and maybe we'll move on to one of the other questions get asked about a lot, um, which is modeling, CFD modeling, and maybe mm -hmm. you can tell us like, how much it's actually used. Um, is, is this the starting point, a CFD model, or um, yeah, what do you do when you design a blade? Yeah, so if you go up uh, two slides to slide six, got a pretty picture here that I like to show when I'm talking <laughs> about CFD. Um, CFD is amazing but sometimes it gets a bit of a bad reputation i've often heard cfd equal colors for directors um <laughs> that can be that can be true <laughs> that can be very true sometimes because like any tool rubbish in rubbish out and the pictures look really impressive so unless you really take a deep dive it can be difficult to to know whether your picture is useful or not so cfd for a wind turbine gets uh, pretty difficult if you're trying to model a rotor because of the the scales involved so you want to capture a boundary layer, so this layer of uh, viscous flow close to the surface. You want to capture that in great detail to understand how the rotor is going to perform. But that means you'll have to have cells that are like 10 to the minus 6 in terms of height. But the blade could be 100 metres long. So suddenly you've got this huge range of scales that you're trying to capture in the flow, which makes it computationally challenging. So this image we have on the screen here, um, it has about 80 million computational cells in. Uh, it took me about six hours to solve this on 800 processing cores. So it's a big investment from time and, and money. So that means that most wind turbine blades you see out today have not had any CFD analysis done on them whatsoever. It just won't have been done. Um, just wanted yes, to put so. that that image up. That's from my PhD thesis, actually. Yep. Yep. Um, that's the CFD mesh that I did. And I also wanted to point out that I found, because I'm, I'm no CFD expert, I just used it to get the loads to do structural analysis. Um, mm -hmm. And I did find that I could tweak the parameters to get whatever answer I wanted. Um, so it was really critical for me that I had a, a design that I had some mm. um, uh, some. And some other results that I could um, validate against so that I knew yes. I wasn't just making something up. And I do see um, from uh, companies that I work with, that's a very frequent trap that people yep. <laughs> do only CFD and they find that they've improved efficiency by 300% or something. And um, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful you, when that happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Until you have some real world data to calibrate your model, it, it's not going to tell you anything. Is um, yeah, that's my no. interpretation anyway. No. So two things that we look at in terms of validation is um, wind tunnel testing um, and flow visualization in the field. So if you've got wind tunnel test results. Uh, lift and drag, you can look to calibrate your CFD models and uh, make sure you're converging to get a, like a mesh dependent solution, mm -hmm. i.e. the number of cells in your mesh isn't affecting your solution. And we can also look at flow visualization in the field. So if you just hop back to my uh, picture, um, the black lines in this image are surface streamlines. So if you were to put some dye onto a wind turbine and, and let it run, you would hope to see the dye move uh, in these kind of patterns that the black lines show, these surface streamlines. So down in the root region, you can see that the streamlines are actually kind of running root to tip. They're running up the blade. Um, and the reason for this is the flow is stalling. It's separating due to the really high angles of attack and the thick aerofoils. And then we've got the, the fact this rotor spinning is then pushing, like pumping this flow out towards the tip. And even without dye, if you can look at a wind turbine in the field um, that's a little bit grubby, you'll see these patterns. You'll see these kind of fairly distinct lines down in the root region. And if you actually take really detailed photos, maybe put some wool tufts on the blade, you can actually compare that to a CFD simulation. And we've done that at Power Curve and found that CFD does a wonderful job at predicting where that separation zone is. Um, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I actually never never saw that before. And um, that raises a question um, I think one of my Patreons asked about the, the shape of the nacelles. Um, sometimes you see, you know, a streamlined nacelle shape. And I guess mm. probably we're talking mostly about like the Enercon wind turbines. I'll yeah. see if I can look up a picture in a second. Yeah. Um, and they've got the, it, they don't have the same shape as this blade here where it tapers off to a, like a cylinder at the, at the blade root The um, you know, the aerodynamic surface goes all the way down. Down. Um, if you have that optimized um, like root region and nacelle, would you see less um, of the span-wise yeah. yeah, streamlines? Yeah, 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 you would. And, and Enercon's a really good example. So Enercon made the decision quite early on to try to aerodynamically optimize the very root region of the blade. So they have huge cord lengths down towards the root of the blade and very highly twisted sections. And yes, I've analyzed those blades in CFD and they have less uh, root separation than, than other wind turbines. Yeah, so you can see a, a picture there. The question is, 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 it, um, is it giving a lower cost of energy? I mean, that, that's what all this is about, right? Is making lower cost of energy. So there's not a lot of energy to be gained in the root region. You know, you could double your performance two meters from the hub kind of doesn't really matter so much because the moment arm to generate your torque is only two meters. If you do something out the tip, you've got 80 meters of moment arm to play with. So aerodynamically, yes, it's nicer from a cost of energy perspective. I, I don't know. I'd have to have to dive into Enercon uh, design in more detail, but there's a lot of material there. And the question is, is all that extra material worth a couple of tenths of a percent? Yeah, and I mean, um, they haven't taken over the <laughs> the, the no. world with this design, no. obviously. So, I mean, the obvious conclusion is that there's not a big big difference in it. No. Um, yeah. yeah. And so just to clarify for people that maybe aren't um, totally uh, as, as maybe not as expert as uh, you or I on this topic. So when you're talking about the, the torque from the wind turbine blade, it's um, the that comes from the force times the distance that it is from the yes. hub, right? So the further from the hub, the higher that torque is. So the blade tip is making a much bigger contribution than the than the blade towards a root. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So as a as a rough rule of thumb, you could say the outer one third of the blade span is responsible for at least 50% of the torque, at least, sometimes a little bit more. Okay. And actually that that leads quite nicely to sort of talk about the CFD and design methods a bit more. So if you think of a blade sliced up into lots of 2D sections, then what you can do is analyze each of those sections on its own. And then you can sum up the contributions of each of those sections to understand rotor performance. And this is how the industry works. And it's called blade element momentum or BEM theory. So this is a two dimensional theory and it's basically how all uh, wind turbine blades have been designed. 
to some extent. And BEM is great because it's fast, it's 2D, uh, it's really easy to compute. The problem is that when we look at the CFD image here, BEM cannot capture any of this interesting three-dimensional flow. So if you're trying to really optimize a blade, you can't do it with a blade element momentum theory. So the industry is reluctantly doing more and more CFD because you need to optimize now. The competition is getting hotter. The cost of energy is being driven down. You can't keep making rotors bigger all the time in all situations. So therefore, you have to start looking at, uh, at these more interesting areas that are more complex to understand. And that's where the CFD comes in. Um, so all the big new rotors, they will have had CFD done because you kind of have to to understand these complex flow regions. Yeah, OK. I was just trying to find I have done um, a few videos on on BEM. So um, I'll put the links in the description for anyone watching mm, later. I've got some detailed instructions on how to do it and including um, one time I analyzed. Um, have you seen, Nick, have you seen this Veritasium video on downwind faster than the, the wind? <sighs> I'm sure I have actually, but I shall have a look after this. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring it up in a second, but anyway, I analyzed that using the BM, BEM as well, because that's just a, just a propeller, which is effectively a wind turbine running backwards. So, yes. Yeah. So I think, you know, when it comes to CFD, um, you just think of it as a, as a step up in terms of fidelity from BEM. So BEM, 2D, sections can't talk to each other. CFD, 3D, everything can interact and move in a much more physical way. So great for understanding the root great for understanding the tip. But to be honest, all the stuff in between, it's kind of okay in BEM because the flow is fundamentally two-dimensional. So from about 40% span to 80% span, BEM is okay. It's kind of the extremes that the CFD really comes into its own. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just quickly show um, that that's the the Blackbird video, that cart, and that's my my response to it. Excellent. Um, showing how that works, and then here's my my series on wind turbine design, and um, this is the one I'm talking about with the oh, it's these two. Um, Actually, yeah, I've I've watched your Ben videos, and I can highly recommend them. I think they're really, <laughs> really good intros to the subject. So. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for me to watch those early early videos, <laughs> but I think that the content is still still good. Content, hopefully, the content so. <laughs> is definitely good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, shall we move on then to yeah. um, <laughs> to winglets? Um, yeah, and I let's... know you've got a slide on on this here. Yeah. So basically, I mean, not every aeroplane wing has a has a winglet, but you do see them a lot. And I've never seen a real wind turbine with winglets. I don't think. I know that there are a few. Maybe maybe I have seen one or two, but they're not mm. common, right? So, um, what do winglets do, and and why aren't they so common on wind turbine blades? Yeah. So I'm glad we started with the CFD thing because CFD is critical, really, to understand winglets because. A winglet is very much not 2D and it's very much not operating in two-dimensional flow. So what we have at the tip of the blade is uh, we have a discontinuity. So in order to generate lift, a blade has got suction forces on one side and pressure forces on another that you know you can look at in, in some of other Rosie's videos and Ben videos. But obviously when the end of the blade is reached, something has to happen. Um, because those forces, those pressure forces are no longer separated by a blade. So what happens is you kind of get the flow wrapping around the tip of the blade because there's a, there's a movement between the pressure and the suction surfaces. And by having that flow kind of wrapping around the tip of the blade, you get a vortex being shed. And you can see this, there's some really nice videos on the web. If you just search for like aeroplane vortex or wind turbine vortex, you'll see like smoke visualizations of this vortex being shed off the tip of a wing, whether it be a wind turbine or an aircraft. And actually this top image we have here, uh, the gray thing is the blade. And this is a CFD simulation that was carried out by someone at the Danish Tech University. And what they've done is they plotted the vorticity um, on a plane behind the blade and the red is high vorticity and, and blue is low vorticity so you can kind of see the structure of the vortex in this image there's this kind of red lump towards the tip of the blade so this is the vortex that's being shed from from the blade tip and what this vortex is doing is it's influencing the flow uh, for many many meters around it 
so kind of the outer 10, 20, 30 meters of a big blade is going to feel an influence from that vortex being shed. So that vortex is actually going to start inducing velocities along the blade. And by doing that, it's actually, we call it induced drag. So by inducing velocities, it's changing the, ang the relative angles of the flow that the blade is seeing. And that's giving you uh, this induced drag term. And any kind of drag is bad uh, because it reduces your lift to drag ratio and it reduces your efficiency. So that's kind of the problem. We have this vortex at the tip of the blade. And what a winglet is trying to do is trying to reduce the impact that that vortex has on the aerodynamic performance. So if you can move that vortex further away from the blade, or if you can kind of break it up a bit more or diffuse it more, then it's going to have less influence on the flow nearby. So on the lower image we have here, uh, there was that blade. Oh yeah, here we are. Oh, so sorry, that's, I just, uh... that's fine. So that's <laughs> yeah, the vortex yeah. being shed from the tip of uh, an aeroplane wind. It's the same principle on a, on a wind turbine. You've got this tube of spiraling flow coming off the very tip of the blade as the pressure tries to wrap around and equalize itself between the pressure and the suction surfaces. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite a nice visualization actually. Sometimes you can see it I always um, if I'm sitting near the wing on, on a on a flight yeah. and I always try to, um, yeah, to look out the window and you, you can sometimes see the... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah you can, yeah, the particularly if you yeah. get the right kind of cloud formations that you're going through, you can kind of see it. Um, so with a winglet, uh, so in this lower image, it's the same uh, colour scheme. So this plot of vorticity and we can see the vortex structure is quite different. It's kind of been smeared out a bit and it's kind of peak vorticity the kind of lump of red has been moved further away from the blade so by doing that um, the winglet design has actually reduced the induced drag component it's increased the l over d of the outer sort of section of the blade and you get more power and typically you see a couple of percent increases in power with the right winglet design um, so in some ways you think, great, well, we should just have winglets then. Yeah, sounds amazing. <laughs> um, sounds, <laughs> sounds amazing. But unfortunately, like anything, there's there's a trade-off to be had. So firstly, you can see this this is quite an interesting structure now sat on, on the end of the blade. So there's a cost and a complexity and a, and a mass of actually having the structure out there on the tip of the blade. Um, it's quite difficult to transport and protect it. Um, compared to just a standard blade when it's being moved around in the field. Uh, the lightning implications uh, are not to be dismissed. So the, the way lightning strikes and interacts with a, with a blade tip will change if, if you have a winglet there. Um, and again, it kind of comes down to this, this cost of energy thing. So sometimes a winglet will make sense and sometimes it won't depending on the blade design and the size of the winglet required and et cetera, et cetera. So, so winglets aerodynamically uh, will work. They, they just will. They'll give you some performance. The question is, does it give you enough poor performance for a low enough cost to make it worthwhile putting out there on a turbine? So, so it's kind of, there's, there's not an easy answer, like, like with almost any engineering topic, mm -hmm. but from an aerodynamics perspective, perspective you can show fairly fairly easily that a winglet will bring benefit but that doesn't mean that it's going to give you a, a cost of energy benefit all the time okay so when i was um i studied one one year of aerospace engineering um as part of my undergraduate degree at um at uc davis and when we're starting studying aerodynamics there they mentioned an aircraft design they mentioned that the or the the prevailing wisdom was that a winglet, it helps, but it's only kind of the same, um, I'll try to get my hand on camera, the same as if you had the same amount of material, but, you know, like whether it's up like that or um, you just extend the span of the, the wing, it was basically the same effect. Um, is that is that true or was that an urban myth that's it's not, like not 20, quite 20 years old now? <laughs> I've just seen there's a couple of related questions come up in the, uh, in the yeah, comments exactly. as well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> The exactly. questions are a bit delayed. So thank you, Rich. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, exactly um, what I'm asking. So if you just extend the blade, 
you will also get more power um but it generates that power in a different way so if you just extend the blade you're adding more lift forces and more drag forces more lift forces and that's sort of giving almost like a direct torque mm. contribution on that section okay does it maybe uh, relate wing... to this next comment then from yes Olek. Yeah. as wings bend in stronger winds how does that influence the winglets so the winglet itself as a general rule is not really contributing to torque like it's mm. not suddenly putting this big torque force right on the tip it's this reduction mm. in induced drag that is the dominant mm. effect so it's two different physical mechanisms and then the question is, well, which is better? And then it probably comes down to a question of load contribution. So can you get the same torque increase for a smaller load increase? And in general, again, the jury, I say the jury is still out to an extent. In general, I would say that winglets do a better job at that. So winglets should be able to give you a bigger torque increase for the same loads increase and that's because they're reducing this induced drag component over quite a significant proportion of the blade whereas mm. a blade extension does nothing about that it just gives you more torque right at the very tip and from a loads perspective you don't really want a big torque increase right at the very tip because that's where yeah. your big moments are so so that's kind of the trade-off um winglets wouldn't really um they wouldn't be designed to flatten out Typically, I would say they'd want to be a fairly stiff structure, so otherwise the, the strains and stresses in the material could, could get really high. But yeah. it's a very good question about what happens when the wing bends, because depending on which way your winglet goes, that will influence your tower clearance. And the kind of literature that's out there at the moment suggests that a winglet pointing towards the tower, so downwind, is a little bit more efficient than one pointing upwind. But the mm. problem is... <laughs> if it's pointing down when it's pointing towards the tower so if your tower clearance is already on the limit a winglet's not going to help you um so again that's another design consideration when you're putting a winglet on does it affect okay. the tower clearance yeah. when i look at that um the, this design that you've got on the bottom there i see two two pain points first is manufacturing it's really hard to um when you do the resin infusion the um, resin yeah. into the into the fiberglass it's a huge pain to have curves in it it was even you know a challenge when we started doing yeah. pre-bent blades um and i do have a video on that topic as well um, and then secondly, transport. I mean, blades do get broken in transport um, probably way more fre frequently than people might expect or, yeah. or hope. Yeah. Um, it's been a bit of a headache for me in some of my projects, and that looks like it wants to wants to break. I would think it might be better it, it, off it attaching them later. Yeah. Um, so, know, yeah, re re on. retrofit winglets might be a better solution. For sure. But then if you're retrofitting a winglet, um, there's kind of two fundamental mechanical routes to go. One, one is uh, like a, a fairly old school mechanical joint, some kind of fixings, or you can go for maybe a fully bonded uh, joint. But if you're trying to do a fully bonded joint that has to be of a really nice quality, very, very difficult to do uh, if you're not in a controlled environment. So if the blade's on the ground still, probably not bad, but if it's hanging in the air, again, Doable, definitely doable, just a little bit yeah. harder. Okay. I'm starting to see why manufacturers aren't rushing to install winglets everywhere. It sounds like quite a lot of yeah. headaches for, um, yeah. I mean, if it, if it was, sorry. Yeah, if it was a if it was a really really noticeable improvement, I'm sure everyone would have sorted out the problems. But it seems like it's not not quite the cost to headache or the benefit to headache um, ratio isn't. Quite yeah, right. exactly. So as an aerodynamicist, I really like them. I think they're really <laughs> yeah. interesting. I think you can show that they they work, and you can make it cost effective. I just wouldn't say universally you can yep. make it cost effective. It's sort of turbine specific. Okay, so I might move on then now. Yep. Um, that's, I mean, that's been a great answer. And actually, I have, I've never heard that question explained so well. So thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you for giving us that. Next one um, that everybody is dying to know, apparently, uh, because of the number oh, of whales. questions yes. that I get asked. <laughs> Tubercles. So yeah. I've done a little bit of sleuthing into this as well, like because I, I have got asked a lot of times about whether um, wind turbine um blade designers are using tubercles on their wind turbines mm -hmm. and a lot of read a lot of articles that assert that this is the norm and I have never seen a lumpy <laughs> leading edge of a wind turbine blade um I think yeah. that it started with some 
some academic research that got picked up by some um, some it's media outlets. It's been an awful lot of the news. Yes. Yeah. So, what do you know about <laughs> about tubercles and uh, and if they improve anything worth improving? Yeah. Well, firstly, um, I really like whales. I think whales are brilliant. Um, <laughs> So therefore, I always would take anything to do with the whale seriously. You know, they've been around a long time. And almost anything in nature is certainly worth a look because it probably is there for a reason. So the tubercles are, are really, are really interesting. So uh, how to start? So when you have these kind of lumps and bumps on a, on a leading edge, they are going to create uh, some vortices. Basically, you're going to have some kind of vortex structures and non two dimensional flow structures moving downstream from from these devices, let's call them devices on, on the leading edge. And if we think about that uh, lift versus angle of attack plot that we were looking at um, earlier, so lift going linearly and then stalling, if you could do something to make that stall happen later, that that may be an interesting thing. So, yeah, that, that plot there. So the, if we look at the blue curve on the left, yeah, if we can move stall to the right, that could be interesting, potentially. And from what I gather, um, the inventors of this device, if you can call them inventors, are saying, well, you can increase your stall margin and therefore you can have more power. So herein lies the interesting bit. So in principle, tubercles aerodynamically will do something. Uh, I can definitely believe that in a real world situation, they can increase your stall angle. I think that's kind of, that's fine. Um, the question is, is it useful? So that's, that's the question here. So should you see them on wind turbines? And I would say probably, probably not. Um, and the reason is um, your wind turbine shouldn't be operating anywhere near stall. So a modern <clears throat> pitch regulated turbine, it's operating at an angle of attack to give it a good lift to drag ratio. And that angle of attack is gonna be several degrees away from stall. So the question then is, if I increase my maximum lift coefficient, and if I, so if I increase the peak of that blue curve, and if I push it to the right, what does it, what does it do for me? So if your blade has got a really low stall margin <clears throat> and it's starting to stall, then that could be useful. But, but as, as I say, a blade shouldn't be anywhere near that. It would be a really bad design if it was stalling quite a lot. So I think my perspective on this is that tubercles don't necessarily have an obvious use when it comes to modern wind turbine because they're going to increase sail max and stall margin, but actually they should kind of be okay anyway. And the downside of increasing your maximum lift coefficient is that when you're in certain extreme load situations, that means the blade can generate more lift at some extreme angles of attack. And that's bad, that's really bad. So if you increase the maximum lift coefficient an aerofoil can reach, you technically increase the maximum load that that blade can see. So in an ideal world, you want the lowest CL max possible with the biggest stall margin, because then your loads stay low, no matter what the angle of attack, and your blade is always in a nice kind of aerodynamically stable state away from stall. Um, so I'm gonna draw a parallel with um, uh, Vortex generators. So if you go to slide three, uh, Rosie, Yep, that one. So vortex generators do kind of the same thing, in my opinion. So a vortex generator is a little triangular fin, typically that sits on the surface of a of a blade. I do and have a it does. Of that. I'm ah, to great. Find. Um, yeah. So yeah, vortex generator. The, the clue is the clue, the clue is in the name. It generates a vortex, a little bit like these these tubercles do, and what happens when a vortex is being created is, is that vortex has a low pressure core. So it, what it does is it kind of sucks or entrains higher energy fluid from away from the surface and it pulls it down to the surface. And that can be useful. Again, we're kind of skirting on lots of topics that we might have to dive into detail more uh, at another day. But um, <laughs> when you're, yeah, so there's a vortex. So when your flow 
is close to stall, it basically starts to peel off the aerofoil from the trailing edge. That's where it starts to peeling off. So your vortex generator, by injecting energy into the flow, is re-energizing this critical area, the, the boundary layer of the flow, and helping that flow remain stuck and attached for the entire cord length. And that's what we see on this left-hand image. So this is a, a wind tunnel, smoke uh, and laser image. Okay, so this top, bottom bottom part has those little plastic fins yes, um, on exactly. it. exactly. And the top part exactly. just has smooth. Oh, you can see doesn't. the shape of the profile there of the vortex generators. So yeah. in the wind tunnel, when you get to these kind of higher angles of attack, the top of the air, you can see there's this big stall zone. There's kind of this recirculation of flow you can see in the smoke. But on the lower half of the aerofoil with the vortex generators, that flow is remaining nice and straight and attached for the entire cord length. So I think vortex generators, again, I haven't simulated it, I haven't measured it, but my, my opinion is that vortex generators are going to have a pretty similar effect to this, uh, this sort of whale fin leading edge. They're going to increase stall margin um, and uh, give you that higher CL max. So why is why could that be useful? Well, if you go up a slide, Rosie, when a blade is designed, it's designed with assumptions of clean flow, clean surfaces. So that's all well and good. But when you get out into the real world, and you'll probably see some of the turbines in Rosie's video, actually, they don't look like lovely clean wind turbine, a uh, wind tunnel models. They might have dirt on them, bugs, ice, erosion of the leading edge. So in those situations, um, your stall margin is reduced uh, and your performance gets worse. So vortex generators in these situations can be really helpful because what they do is they actually restore some of the lift that is being lost uh, due to these kind of surface contamination issues. But importantly, you can't get back to the clean curve the clean performance curve, because even if the VG recovered all of the losses, it has a loss itself, like a, we call it a parasitic loss. So it's something that sits on the surface, it has a drag. So again, you know, we kind of have a tubercle now in a sense, we have vortex generators and sometimes they're really appropriate and really useful. So I guess the argument is, well, is could a tubercle be better? I don't know for sure, so I haven't done the studies, but again, my feeling is it looks like a pretty complex shape to mould, to create, to maintain, and it doesn't stop the process of this kind of leading edge erosion. So, yeah, whales could be useful, but I kind of think we almost have a little, little bit of a whale equivalent with the vortex generators, basically. Okay, so I just have to read this comment from Paul Cummings, 55. Are uh, there a solution in search of a problem? And that's one of my favorite <laughs> sayings for yeah, uh, I I'm agree. such a, I agree. Yeah, yeah. like a, I'm such a, I don't know, a, a Grinch or a grumpy, grumpy old, old lady often when it comes to, you know, new, exciting um, technological innovations. And that's one of my favorite things to say about things that are like exciting, but don't have a real obvious application, a solution in search of a problem. Yeah, but I did yeah. also want to go on to another interesting comment from um, Orlick on the tubercles. They're used in high-end computer fans for a few years now. Mm -hmm. They drastically decrease fan noise. I could see tubercles on wind turbines that are allowed closer to settlements. And I thought that is uh, an interesting segue into another animal-inspired wind turbine <laughs> um, innovation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I believe that it's animal-inspired. I know that it's um, maybe... Maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but um, yes. yeah, serrations. I'm serrations. talking about serrations, yes. and serrations. I have I have got a oh wait slide no. slide five. I've got a nice picture as well. Oh, you've got the owl picture. Yeah, I just want to show the owl. <laughs> That's it. I often use but... an owl. I often use a barn owl in my slides. <laughs> I've um yeah, I love I love owls, and I have never never seen one in the wild yet. But yeah, so I, I mean, I have talked to, I know I had some colleagues who, or one colleague in particular who did his PhD on, um, yeah, trailing edge serrations and, and noise, especially all kinds of noise reduction. And he said that it's a bit of an urban myth that the inspiration came from owl feathers, but nevertheless, owls are 
very silent when they fly um, and wind turbines would like to be more silent. So um, can you can you tell us about serrations and I'll go back to your, your presentation. Yeah, definitely. So the owl, the owl wing is much more beautiful than a serration. Let's just start off by saying that. But a serration is, um, it has a functional beauty, should we say. So the yeah. serrations are this middle image and they basically look like saw teeth. So I'll quickly just segue back to that question about the, the tubercles and noise. So there's there's a couple of sources. Uh, if we think about how noise is generated, the dominant noise source for a wind turbine is the interaction of a turbulent boundary layer with a blunt trailing edge. So it's this interaction of the boundary layer with that edge, and then that noise is scattered out into the environment. So if you want to think about how to reduce noise, there are typically two main ways you can do it. One is to look at the turbulent boundary layer and the boundary layer properties. And the other way is to look at the scattering mechanism. So uh, a tubercle or a vortex generator may help reduce noise because if the boundary layer is starting to separate, it's getting thicker and thicker and thicker and that thicker boundary layer is going to give uh, more noise when it hits the trailing edge. So if you can keep the boundary layer thin, then you may reduce your noise level. So if a tubercle is creating uh, vortices and increasing your stall margin, or vortex generators do the same thing, then that could reduce noise because it's reducing the thickness of the boundary layer. A serration is not trying to reduce the thickness of the boundary layer, that's trying to change the scattering mechanism. So what a serration is doing with these angled edges is it's scattering the sound in, in a very different way to just coming off this blunt trailing edge. And by tuning the length and the angle and the aspect ratio of these serrations, you can change the scattering mechanism in such a way um, that you reduce the overall sound power level of the turbine. So actually serrations and vortex generators together can actually be a really interesting combination uh, when it comes to noise reduction because one is hitting the boundary layer problem so the boundary layer getting thicker and the serrations are hitting the scattering mechanism uh, problem so the two together can can work quite quite nicely okay cool um can i ask a related question and this isn't one that i pre-warned you about so it's sure. uh <laughs> trap. so one of the um guys from my patreon mm. group from actually from the the discord server asked could um slots leading edge devices near the wind turbine blade tip improve energy generation in weak winds um when rotational speed of the turbine is low and that made me think of another topic mm. that i used to use when i did this um aero design um competition when i was at university um it was called yeah sae aero design it's a bit like that formula um sae project that a lot mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. students do and we designed a, a model wind turbine um not a model wind turbine a model aeroplane a uav um and that had to carry as much weight as possible and you know had a bunch of design constraints it's a super cool project to highly recommend to any students out there and one of the things that i uh, i remember that teams were starting to use back then like 20 years ago because i'm super old um was riblets uh mm -hmm. so inspired apparently by nature again by sharks and i think similar to what we've seen on those um you know fancy swimsuits that yep. um olympians yep. wear um is this is this a thing on wind turbines and if yeah. not why not <laughs> or yeah. tell us what, uh, they, what uh, they do yeah. maybe first great question <laughs> yeah. so these again it's kind of a a bit of a there's kind of some vortex mechanics going on here so you can imagine we've got all these sharp little edges and channels um along the blade so you're going to have some interesting flow structures but the flow structures are going to be really really close to the surface so I think to understand this, we have to dig a little deeper into uh, the flow around a, a wing. So this this boundary layer thing that I've mentioned a few times, just to, to explain a bit more, what we define as the boundary layer is the area of flow from where it's zero, where it's rubbing against the walls, it has to be zero there, up to where it kind of meets the, the free stream velocity, the surrounding flow velocity. So that's that, that distance, that thickness of fluid we call the boundary layer. It's dominated by viscous effects and it's where all the action happens basically. So the health and the behavior of this boundary layer determines the performance of your aerofoil and therefore your blade. 
So things like riblets, they're actually looking to modify the very bottom layer of the boundary layer, almost like the viscous sublayer. And if you can basically improve the health of that uh, boundary layer through something like a riblet, then it may be that you can uh, maybe keep lamina flow for a little bit longer or reduce the skin friction a little bit. And by doing that, you should increase your L over D and you should increase your, your turbine performance. So I think, again, aerodynamically, something like a riblet, I've seen some data that, that seems fairly convincing that they can modify the boundary layer in, in such a way that your, your drag is a little bit lower. Okay, great. So why don't we see them on wind turbines? So two, two things. Let's say someone tells you that I can increase lift to drag ratio by 15%. I mean, that's a lot. Let's say just that, that's a lot of lift to drag ratio. If you covered your entire blade in this stuff and lift to drag ratio goes up 15%, power may only go up a few tenths of a percent, like half a percent maybe. Again, depends on the blade, but let's say half a percent power. Half a percent power might only be 0.25% annual energy production. The rough rule of thumb is if you go up with your power by two, your AEP only goes up by one. And that's because a wind turbine has a, a rated power. So if you increase your performance, lift to drag ratio performance, it only helps you when you're below rated. It's above rated, you're capping the power anyway. So that's why this kind of relationship between power. I just want to quickly explain why that is, because that's um, mm, something sure. I think people can frequently confused about and so I mean you tell me if you think my explanation is, is right or wrong but basically you do a big um, multi-variable optimization on the whole wind turbine to try and figure out what's the cheapest energy you can get so you want to either improve improve the amount of energy you capture each year or decrease the the cost and so if you um, you're choosing the generator size you don't want to choose it so that it's so big that you only you need really high wind speeds to reach it because then most of the year your yeah. um, huge expensive generator isn't really performing as well as it could so you end up um, yeah choosing a, a compromised generator and a lot of the year you see, if you look at the power curve on a wind turbine, it yeah, it flattens out above the rated wind speed, and then doesn't matter um, how efficient your blade is because it's uh, yeah. it's topped out. Is that, exactly. is that a good explanation? No, nope, perfect explanation. So, so with these riblets, let's let's uh, assume they work because you know we're not in the business of of uh, kind of dismissing all these things out. Let's assume they do what they say and they give some more L over D. There's some good physical reasons why they should. Is it worth it? It might not be. You know, I, I've <laughs> you've got to cover your entire blade in this thing. There's going to be a cost associated with that, a manufacturing process, a maintenance process. Yeah, it's is going it to erode, worth, right? Uh, yeah, I is mean, it worth a couple have, of tenths yeah. of a percent AEP? At the moment, I, I don't think it is. So, again, just be aware people throwing around efficiency numbers, which there's all kinds of efficiency. And I've seen papers about this riblet actually that say 10% L over D increase, therefore 5 or 10% more power. What? I mean, like what? <laughs> I literally just write a simple equation. It, it does not work like that. Um, it doesn't translate one to one. So, yes, these could give a bit more power. Does the cost of energy reduce? I don't I don't think it does. Uh, not, not, at, not at the moment. Not to say it won't at some point, but today... I've seen no data that suggests this would reduce cost of energy when deployed on a megawatt plus turbine. Okay, that's um, yeah, that, I I think that's a whole another another topic on um that I probably will do one day about the the whole optimization of yeah, what mm -hmm. actually matters. Um, where is it worth spending your your effort to get um improved performance? But I did want to just quickly raise a, a question that uh, um. Yes. Have you as commented from Adrian? So why does frost or ice when it builds up on a wind turbine blade, why does that decrease the efficiency but scaly skin reduce drag? Is it not a similar rough surface? And I, I just my old job, I've spent four years working as a de-icing engineer. So that's uh, <laughs> very close to my heart. I did get quite sick of it, but maybe one day I will make a video all about um, wind turbine icing. It became quite topical last year during the Texas freeze. <laughs> yes, it did. Um yeah, but Nick, do you have something quickly to say about that? Sure. I'll just quickly say about the, the big storms in the US. Although a few wind turbines stopped, entire piles of coal froze so solid they couldn't put them into power stations to burn. So 
it's, it's not as <laughs> anyway but yes on um frost and uh, scales i think generally it's a matter of uh, scales not uh the scales is a thing that length scales so frost and ice are on a much bigger length scale than these kind yeah, of they make this huge lumps um yeah off the the front of the leading edge and it yeah it's just i mean it can actually increase the, the um the loads but then that's a problem as well that it's you know increase yeah. the, the load so it changes the, the shape it fundamentally changes the shape of your aerofoil um in most cases so that's that's in general bad so it's it's a much bigger structure um than these kind of riblets we're talking about which are yeah tiny tiny yeah yeah okay we are actually getting close to time and which is a shame because i feel like i could spend several more hours but maybe yes. um yeah every everybody isn't so excited to listen to hours and hours of blade aerodynamics as, as you and i knew but yeah. i did want to ask a question so uh, and there's other kinds of blade add-ons that we didn't mention um i'll see if i i think you've got a slide with some other ones maybe um yeah, i could just quick i'll quickly just do a like a 30 second summary of these three just as almost like a recap so vortex generators they can be used on the outboard region of the blade and the inboard region so on the outboard region they're typically used to recover losses due to rough surfaces and leading edge erosion and on the inboard part of the blade they're used to reduce that stall zone that we looked at earlier so energize the flow reduce the stall zone so VGs have two uses, fundamentally. Serrations, their primary purpose is to reduce uh, noise. So you see them on the outer one third of the blade, typically. And gurney flaps, which we haven't covered yet, but they would typically sit on the inner one third of the blade. And they're a little device that sits near the trailing edge to effectively add camber to an airfoil. So deflect the streamlines and give you more lift for the same angle of attack. And so it's the same down. as um, on an aeroplane when they're, you know, taking off or landing yes. and they put their flaps out to, yeah. yeah, okay. Same same principle. So we're just trying to get more lift down in the route where these really thick aerofoils are struggling to generate lift. Yeah, and I do um, just need to also mention one from my old company, LM Wind Power, the T-spoilers, that's something mm -hmm. that um, I haven't heard you talk about, but um, that's it's, another. It's a, it's a gurney flap, effectively. It's, really? Um, okay. It's it's the same principle. It sits a little bit uh, closer towards the leading edge, but its its purpose is basically the same. It's deflecting a streamline to give you effectively more camber and and, yeah. and more lift. So, gurney flaps, T spoilers, they look a little bit different, slightly different position, but they're they're kind of the same device. It's sticking okay. out into the pressure surface to change the pressure distribution. Okay, so all of these these things, and I do have a comment that actually relates to what I'm about to say. So the biggest problem with all these little thingamabobs is the production cost, yeah. extra weight and durability. If it degrades after a year, is it really cost effective to add it? And isn't it just, you know, like adding all this stuff on to like fix a design problem or, you know, like does a well-designed blade even need any of this uh, these thingamabobs? <laughs> So it's a really it's a really good question yes durability is key you have to have these things stay on the blade for health and safety as much as anything else you can't have things falling off a wind turbine uh they can they're often considered a fix and i think that's unfair i think they should be considered as an integral part of any designer's toolbox because they're doing things that a normal aerofoil shape cannot do um, it's really difficult to mould vortex generators into a surface, and yet they can be really useful devices uh, to help improve performance. Uh, gurney flaps, yeah, you can maybe mould the blade to have a thicker trailing edge and to change the profile in the route, but then there's a structural trade-off, and it may, may well be cheaper and easier to make the blade as you do and then stick on a bit afterwards. Same with serrations. You could mould that into the blade, but it's going to be really, really hard. I mean, almost impossible to get a to get a product like that moulded and working in a blade. So I think you have to, yeah, consider them as part of the toolbox. But in most cases, they're doing something that a standard aerofoil shape cannot do on its own. So if you consider them as part of your design to begin with, you will generally be able to get a more optimised uh, blade and probably a more cost-effective one because you're not trying to do everything in one hit in the factory in a mould. Um, 
and power curve you know we, we've put uh, hundreds and hundreds of these devices on we have around 750 turbines spinning with these devices we haven't had uh, a report of a single panel falling off in about seven years of operation so if you put them on correctly and you design them well there's no reason they can't stay there for the for the life of the turbine and if they give you one percent aep annual energy production that's that's a huge amount of energy it's thousands of dollars thousands of euros extra per year in energy and correspondingly a lot less carbon so i i'm all for add-ons but you've got like anything design them properly and make sure they stay on yeah and i i know that um, some of the projects i've worked on you know i've uh, installed prototype devices um into wind turbine blades and sometimes put sensors all over the outside and the wind farm operators were very concerned about much less than one percent annual energy production loss at so one time i was putting an ice detection sensor on a blade and i think it was only two millimeters thick and like you know like this sort of um size mm -hmm. and they told me that I had to get a team up there and remove it after a year because they did, they calculated it would be 0.25% AEP loss yeah. and, <laughs> and that was not in any way acceptable to them. So, um, no. yeah, people people freak out about small small changes in, in AEP. <laughs> they do. And that's why, you know, that's why vortex generators in particular are so useful because these small surface changes such as from dirt, bugs, ice, erosion, they do cost you performance. So if you can do something to get a chunk of that back, you should seriously consider it. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, I just got a couple more interesting questions and then um, then we'll wrap up. So first one from Johannes uh, Nessel Hilstel, I assume he's Danish. Um, are these vortex generators, serrations and gurney flaps made from the same material as the blade itself? Uh, no, typically they are injection molded from asa plastic that's kind of the industry standard material um and that's because that makes them very uh, impact resistant asa is very impact resistant it's also got a very good uv resistance so it won't uh, degrade or yellow or get really brittle over time out in the field okay Sounds um, cost effective as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then question from Adrian. Uh, I design in my free time 3D printed blades. Should I let them be rough or should I smooth them? So I'm oh, assuming that's... that these are small scale. I guess the answer yeah. would be different depending on the size. But what do you yeah, say? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. So in principle, if you're 3D printing a big blade like a commercial blade, yes, you would want it smooth to maintain as much laminar flow as you can. Um, and get as much performance as you can. The problem on a really small blade is that your Reynolds number, um, that's maybe another topic, but your Reynolds number is very low. And that may mean that um, you actually want them rough to promote more turbulent flow to increase your stall margin. I'm afraid that's maybe a little, it's a bit of a hard question for, for now, but look up Reynolds number, look up laminar and turbulent flow and the difference between low Reynolds numbers and higher Reynolds numbers. But depending on the Reynolds number that your blade sees, there could be a benefit in having it rough if it's such a small turbine. Yeah, and I, as a development engineer, I would say make them both ways and see which one works <laughs> better. That will probably be the fastest yes. way to an answer for you. Yes, I agree. But yeah. not, not, a, not a trivial question. A really interesting no, one. I think it's a great question and probably also um, the majority of listeners are, are more likely to be working with um, DIY wind turbines than industrial scale ones. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for that interesting question. So I will um, start to, to wrap up. So I need to thank again the sponsor of the live stream, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. Um, they make a blade lightning protection system. Um, to improve on factory lightning protection systems. And it was interesting, Nick, that you mentioned that the winglets has a big effect on uh, on lightning or potentially has a big effect on lightning too. So yeah, I think lightning is, uh, I know it's causing more and more headaches as, lightning, as we- Lightning causes a lot of headaches and it's very strongly linked to aerodynamics, like almost yeah. everything. So a winglet changes aerodynamics, it's gonna change the, uh, the lightning behavior, yeah. Yeah, um, I definitely gotta do it. A whole uh, 
video on lightning sometime soon. Um, so yet I also I do a podcast with the um, with the guys at WeatherGuard called the Uptime Podcast. Um, so you can check out. I've got links in the description for you can check out the latest episode. Most recently, we talked about the um, there was a recent Vestas ransomware attack, and um, we got yeah. a cybersecurity expert in and talked about that and the cybersecurity for the energy industry in general. Um, we also talked about global air pollution, and I had a slightly controversial view that I actually consider that it's in some ways a like a good thing for the the climate crisis because you know like climate change is this uh, sort of vague, distant, global um, problem, whereas air pollution is you know it's local, it's immediate, it's got obvious causes and solutions. Um, yeah, we also we talk about all sorts of other um, yeah, wind industry tech news and other renewable energy tech news. So yeah, check check out the links in the description. Um, I'll also thank again the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team for their support. Uh, if you want to join the team and um, support the channel's growth and help steer the future direction, um, and you can also join us in the chat on the Patreon-only Discord server, then you can find the Patreon link in the description. Um, I'll just mention a couple of videos. I've been uh, not so good about <laughs> releasing videos lately. I got stuck in the kind of end of year um, big, you know, dump of um, of of real real work not youtube work so i do have one on levelized cost of energy which i've been working on for Excellent. months now yeah so i it's kind of a um it's a very important topic and i'm always referring to it so i wanted to make this video but it's a bit dry um equation yeah there's equations and calculations and an accounting friend of mine actually helped me crunch the numbers and um using a race car analogy to describe that which is a bit topical given that the formula one uh, just wrapped up yesterday mm -hmm. yeah um also got one on carbon capture coming up and then this is the last live stream for 2022, um, uh, for 2021. <laughs> and so the next one will be next year. And I think I'll probably do a roundup of, um, of 2021 and um, the what I think the biggest energy transition news was this year, plus my predictions and hopes for 2022. So um, yeah, if you're watching this live stream on the um, replay or for everybody here, write in the comments for the, the video page, not the, the live comments. Right, what you think the biggest energy news of 2021 was, um, maybe COP26 or a small dip in emissions from COVID or maybe, and probably I'm hoping you think it was a technology innovation. So let me know. Um, I'll see you next year. Thanks again, Nick. For uh, I, think this I'm curious. Been, I think this has been the best live stream yet. So thank you for... <laughs> Oh, your contribution Absol to that. Abs absolute uh, pleasure and yeah thank you for um all the great comments and questions in the in the chat as well it's um yeah it's really good thinking. comments today yeah <laughs> great <laughs> thanks a lot see you next thanks time a lot. see you bye bye